Hey, this is an amazing experience being here at Mythicon. What's up, Mythical Chef Josh here at Mythicon 2022. A bunch of mythical beasts together in a mythical town for a weekend. And it's time to spin the wheel of mythicality! The one and only teams in this game. A dance party. Instead of a special first ever Mythicon. Alright, let's see where this goes! Woo! Slutty Cotton Candy Randy here, tuning in to give you the lowdown hoedown of Rhett and Link's first ever in-person convention, Mythicon 2022. Even though I was incepted in 2017, I've been a religious viewer since season one. So yes, that means 10 years of stuffing my face with mythical content daily. So I made the solo trek out to Austin, Texas Yeehaw! for this once in a lifetime opportunity to meet my heroes and to give you the inside scoop for those of you who opted not to attend this year. Most of y'all watching are probably mythical beasts who didn't get to make it out due to costs, timing, sickness, or maybe you just had better Hall weekend plans. Shout out to all the kids at home. You can achieve anything. Or maybe you're just a casual viewer who wants to hear the tea on Mythical's first attempt at a convention. While Rhett and Link have built a cult-like following that is willing to drop hundreds of dollars and travel across the world for the mere possibility of breathing the same air as them, today I'll be sharing my experience at Mythicon and how it didn't go quite as fans hoped, leaving us questioning if it was worth the hefty cost. But before we get into what went wrong, let me just show you what the convention had to offer for those of you who weren't able to make it. The first main event was the eating contest, hosted by the Mythical Kitchen, obviously. Yes, Eat as much baby food as humanly possible. They gave each contestant enough food to break the Guinness world record. The prize was this blinged out belt like they have in wrestling. I couldn't say for the end of it, but apparently Josh won. Again, no surprise there. Because I have been living the alpha baby mindset for the last six months. I've eaten nothing but baby food. I have showed up to work in this exact outfit every day. It is an issue with HR, and that's fine. The reason I couldn't stay for the end of the eating contest was because I was headed to my meet and greet. So the way this works is that you can be randomly selected to win a meet and greet. I think they just choose across anyone who bought a ticket. Oh my god, I just woke up and I was checking my junk mail and I just found out I've been selected for a meet and greet. A month before, I was notified by email that I did win a meet and greet with a link to a survey. There you can rank your top choices for a meet and greet. The choices were Rhett and Link, Stevie and Chase, the Mythical Kitcheneers, and Jordan and Emily. A week out, I received another email that I got a meet and greet with Stevie and Chase. Out at the Hilton, you can pick up your ticket package, which includes a physical meet and greet ticket, no autographs, no gifts, no cell phone pics. They hide behind this giant red curtain where there's a professional photographer. They asked if I wanted to do any like funny poses and I was totally unprepared for that, so I just did a basic one. Here it is. So I just left the meet and greet and I got to meet Stevie and Chase. And they're just so sweet. They're exactly like I expected them to be. I did a giant Deborah inspired look that day because I knew I was gonna meet Chase. It's funny because not that far ahead of me in line, someone else was also dressed as giant Deborah along with three of her friends who were dressed as Michelle, Chase the cartographer, and Cotton Candy Randy. And I was like, wow, that's a group of four girls. They look so cool. They're around my age. They're all cosplaying. I'm like, they were the first people I encountered that seemed like we could actually be friends. And they did stop me in line, asked to take a photo with me. And then they ended up adopting me into their group. And it's wild because because I went to Mythicon by myself because I don't have any close friends who are as into GMM as I am. Trust me, I've tried converting so many people. I am Rhett like's biggest evangelist, but I think a big part of it is the nostalgia. We grew up watching it. It's kind of hard to start now. Did I see a single Asian person? I don't think so. And because of that, GMM is very, very different from the other content that you consume. And I felt kind of alone in that, but I found so many other people who like, you know, they're also into anime. Two of the girls are like legitimate cosplayers. Another girl in the group, is in the same sorority as me. Like, what are the chances? I also want to jump in real quick and say, and I know a lot of you fellow introverts out there can relate to this, but I'm not one to really love small talk, but I was really pleasantly surprised by the number of deep and interesting conversations I was able to have with a bunch of strangers that I met over the weekend, mostly due to the whole Lost Year series, the story of Rhett and Link's deconstruction, which I deeply, deeply relate with. But I love that it's something that most of us relate to in some way, and we were able to connect on it really quickly and kind of just get deep straight to the point. And it was really enlightening to hear everyone's stories, and it felt really good to share my perspectives as well. And yes, while I don't think I necessarily fall into the usual demographic that watches Rhett and Link, I was still able to find so many people that I felt very similar to in a lot of ways that have nothing to do with Rhett and Link. We may all be very different, but there is one common denominator and that is the reason that we were all here that weekend. Also, everyone was just so, so nice and genuine, just like real nice people. Nice people watch Rhett and Link. If they watch Rhett and Link, 
green flag. Meeting mythical beasts that are very similar to me that I would genuinely probably be friends with in real life was one of the most gratifying parts of this whole experience, but moving on. James in the Shame had his first ever live performance at Mythicon. If you don't know who that is, that's Rhett. He recently dropped an album and it's not entirely my regular style of music, so I haven't listened to the full album, but after seeing it live, I am convinced. Like, especially when he brought his wife, Jessie, the crowd went crazy. <laughs> Hey Jesse, you want to sing that song that I, that I wrote about you? I've said it before and I'll say it again. Rhett and Link, uh, Rhett and Jesse are relationship goals and I do not say that lightly. I teared up. I actually got emotional. Honestly, at this point on day one, I was pretty disappointed with Mythicon. I was not having a great time. I will get more in detail later in this video about the issues, but just know at this moment, this was where all my disappointment and bad attitude towards Mythicon just melted away. I was transported. I really, really enjoyed the performance and I was so close to Red. That was my first time seeing him in real life. He's a very big man. Do you believe that you filled up this whole bucket? We ended the night with karaoke hosted by Emily and the other mythical crew. This was such a blast. This was unexpectedly so much fun. The week leading up to Mythicon, you were able to submit a song request and put down your names or a couple names. They printed those out, threw them in a hat for random drawing, and wow, almost every single person who went up and sang was like, actually really, really good. There was this one girl who sang No Diggity and like my group was saying that like, wow, I feel like I'm at her concert right now. Like I wouldn't mind just like listening to her the rest of the night. <laughs> It was such a wholesome party and a great way to end the night. This is what it looked like under my hat this whole time. I set my alarm for 6.30 a.m. tomorrow because I want to get there. Like, first thing, I want to be on the first shuttle. I'm serious about this. I'm determined to get a tattoo appointment. They've ran out so quickly today. I'm gonna get ready for bed now. I will see you guys in the morning. Bye. Good morning. It's 7 a.m. My goal is to be out of here by 9 a.m. Today is my most complicated outfit. Let's go. All right, we're back. I filmed all my getting ready content for TikTok, but I'll do a quick fit check for you. Rhinestone leggings, perfect for the rhinestone cowboy thing that they got going on, the dance party at the end. All right, I'm ready to go. If I have time to spare. Are y'all ready to hear your scores after round two? There was team trivia hosted by Davin at the Mythical Society house. I was only able to catch the tail end of this, but the gist of it was that there were four rounds. You're split up into groups and each group gets a sheet of paper. They play the questions on the screen, some of which included pre-recorded clips of Rhett and Link. You can you help us here? That's right, for this final round, I want you to guys name the 13 Willet episodes. It was ranked, I don't remember if there was a prize, but at the end, they brought up Michelle and she did the fancy pants dance, so I think we all won. Here we come to Rhett and Link Live, the main event, the live show. It was also live streamed for everybody. I hope y'all got the video on demand if you were not there because oh my goodness, my mind was blown at this. I mean, I already have really high expectations. Anytime they have a live show like Good Mythical Evening or their all day live stream, I already know it's gonna be really good. They always produce really high quality stuff so I already have really high expectations and yet somehow they keep exceeding my expectations. They were live song performances, of course. They sang a few really deep cuts. <laughs> They played a live version of the International Darts game where three mythical beasts got to go up on stage and I'm so jealous of them. Hey girl, I like your boots. But this next part actually blew my mind. So now is the time of the show when we are going to collectively make contact with Ailey. They were joking around like, hey, I've had this idea, like we want to summon aliens, right? You know, call out to them, give them our exact location and see if they'll visit us. And I was like, oh, okay, this is a fun little activity. Get everyone involved. Like they dim all the lights and they're having us like chant and repeat after them. And it was very like meditative. They start handing out glow sticks to everybody. So everyone's waving glow sticks in the air. And this was going on for a long time, okay? I was like, okay, this is a fun activity. But like after a certain point, we had been doing this for so long that I was like, there's gotta be some kind of payoff after this, right? Like, are aliens really gonna come? And sure enough, we're all chanting to the aliens. Everybody has to believe. And then a spacecraft, like a literal sky vehicle beaming bright ass lights, zooms overhead, stops right above the stage and comes down. All the smoke billows out. And I'm like, what the fuck is happening? I'm from the outer space where I've been watching you. They do this whole bit, they meet an alien, they go back in time and they meet their past selves, they go forward in time and they meet their future selves, it was hilarious. Yeah, that was, it was kind of just like a bit 40 years ago, the first Mythicon that we were like, 
in the last minute the combo will, will, will fight to the death. I, mean, I, I don't think the people actually want to see us kill each other. Yes, we do. <laughs> 20 bucks on red! The entire time, they were such charming and engaging performers. I'd never been to any of their previous shows or tours before because back then I was always like a little bit too young or like I didn't have my own money yet. And I always regretted not just going because I'm like, when is the next chance I'm gonna be able to meet Red and Link? Especially when COVID happened, I was like, oh my God, I missed my chance. So obviously when these tickets dropped, I pounced. If you wanted, you could sit all the way in the back in the grass and they had TVs there, but I was like, nah, I'm standing. I'm going as much to the front as possible because this event is very special. It's very new and it's treated as such. However, it's not that big. I was like, if I ever see Rhett and Link live again, I don't know when the crowd is gonna be this small. Like, I'm gonna get as close as I possibly can. Thank you guys for making Mythicon what it was the first time ever. I'm trying not to be nervous because it's the first time I've ever DJed in public. Finally, to close out Mythicon, the Rhinestone Cowboy Disco. There was another DJ playing for about an hour, but we were all waiting for the main event, which was Link. Link, 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 Link. If you've been following Ear Biscuits, then you know that Link had the ox one night at a mythical holiday party and decided that, wow, I wanna become a DJ. Whether or not this was a midlife crisis move, I was hyped. Link is playing his first ever set as a DJ at Mythicon and he's revealing his DJ name. <laughs> Snuggle baby. Snuggle baby. Snuggle, snuggle, snuggle baby. So, Elk Hound Snuggle Baby. Elk Hound Snuggle Baby. Because if you're willing to call me that, and that says something about our relationship. Like, what? I just don't think. Honestly, I'm not a dancer. I'm not one to really get down at the club because I've embarrassed myself dancing so many times that it's just like a little traumatizing for me, but I danced my little booty off. This was the funnest dance party I had ever been to. I stayed the entire time. I danced so hard. I was cheering. I was screaming. I'm surprised I didn't lose my voice. Behind Link, there was the mythical crew, their wives, their kids, their friends, and they're all just dancing, grooving on the stage. They kind of took turns coming up to the front and it was just so hype. The crowd had great energy. I love the song choices that Link made. <laughs> By the end, a good portion of the crowd had shuffled out, but I was determined to stay to the very, very end, and I'm so glad that I did, because then Rhett finally came forward. Rhett was kind of hiding in the back, conserving his energy for most of the time, but he came out to the front and danced on the stage. Jenna crowd surfed, and then I think it was David Hill, he threw his hat out into the crowd, and it landed perfectly on this girl's cowboy hat. Like, what? At a certain point, I'm gonna figure out how to play the last song. And then we're gonna all go home and take showers. This was the perfect way to end Mythicon. My heart was so full. I was just so hyped. Even getting back to my hotel, I was still dancing. All right, let's talk about the part of the convention that I'm going to call the side attractions. Basically, when you first walk in, you kind of walk past the food trucks and then there's this whole like, row of houses, these small little houses on each side. And inside each of them has like a cute little activity you can do. These are ongoing throughout the entire convention for the most part. And these are the things that you would entertain yourself with when there's no main events going on. Um, I will preface this by saying that this is the part of the convention that I kind of took issue with that was a bit disappointing, but I will get more into the details on that soon. First, let me just run you through what they all entail. The first thing which I was most excited about and one you've probably heard about is the tattoo shop. Yes, you can get real tattoos at Mythicon. They drop the tattoo designs that are gonna be available there and I'm definitely making an appointment. I would like this Randler or maybe this Michelle. I actually got a tiny tattoo earlier this year, right here. It says, be your mythical best. And I wrote it in my own handwriting. You know, I actually thought it would be fun if I got Rhett and Link to write it or something, but I was like, you know what? Realistically, I'm never going to meet them in person, go on. And then a few weeks later, they announced Mythicon. I am an appreciator of tattoos, so I was really glad that they had this going on at Mythicon. I felt like it was very on brand. Not that Rhett and Link are like two really tatted up guys, but I feel like for the demographic that I have in my head about the type of people who do watch GMM, seems like a lot of them are into tattoos. Anyways, I was like, okay, great. I could add to my Be Your Mythical Best tattoo and add like the little Randler next to it. You may notice it is not there. Unfortunately, the demand was way too high. I actually thought that, like, I didn't know how this was gonna be set up, but I assumed there would be at least four artists going in there at the same time. I mean, at this point, I didn't even know how many people were gonna be at Mythicon, but that just seemed logical to me, knowing how popular this was gonna be. But they only had two artists going on. They said that they could do three tattoos in one hour. Not 100% sure whether or not they meant three an hour per artist or total between the two artists. Either way, only a very small fraction of the people who wanted tattoos ended up 
getting them. And because of how popular it was, they did allow you to get the designs copied. So if you wanted to take it to another artist outside of the convention, most cases, tattoo artists don't want their designs copied by other people. But in this case, they did allow it because of the sheer volume of interest. I will be speaking more in length about the whole mess of a situation that happened surrounding the tattoos. But according to this Discord user, apparently they had originally planned to have four artists there doing tattoos. But since they were outside of the city, they ran into issues with getting the artists with proper licensing or something. So unfortunately, they could only get two. There was also a virtual reality house. Now, I have never entered the metaverse, so I was pretty excited for this one. One of the choices was going into the GMM set. This was specifically made for Mythicon. You can do things like spin the wheel or uh, like open the filing cabinets and there's little like Easter eggs in there. The other option was a horror game. So this is like a real game that Rhett and Link played on one of the good mythical moors or something. No! Run, Link! Ah! Run! Ah! Hide in the closet! Ah! Hide in the closet! Ah! Hide in the closet! You gotta run and hide in why did you take the freaking hand off? I ran into you and it freaked me out! I will say the idea for this is very, very cool. I love the GMM set. Like, it was executed very well. However, it just did not make sense to me that only four sets were there. Like, the house was very, very small. And they had one set up in each corner. So only four people could go at a time. I'm not sure if they were enforcing a time limit on how long you could do the experience for. But, like, the reason I chose this as one of my first activities is because when I came into Mythicon, I was just greeted with lines. Like, everything was just a mile long line. And I chose this one because it was the only one that didn't have a line. I was like the eighth person in the line. I'm like, okay, this is definitely the shortest thing. So I sat there and waited and it still took me like 45 minutes to get inside to be my turn, which made me even more discouraged about the other lines because they were at least 10 times longer. And I didn't know like, is this gonna be two hours then three hours? Like I couldn't tell. I've never done VR before. And that was so disorienting. Holy fuck, that was really cool though. Next there was the Mythical Museum and the merch store. This was the two in one. So on one side, there's this long line that you can wait in to buy merch. On the other side, there's a line that you can wait in to view the mythical museum, which basically houses and showcases all these real life props and items that were used in the show in the past. So it was a nice walk down memory lane. If you've been a long time viewer like me, there's a lot of fun reminders of things we've enjoyed in past episodes. Here is me with the famous Rhett stick, that stick they famously use as a stand-in for Rhett when he's not there so that they know how tall he is when they're framing the shots for videos. Fun fact, I briefly dated an Asian guy who was 6'7", so yeah. Yes, he did make it his entire personality, and yes, his name did start with a J. And truthfully, there was always a part of me that was kind of sus that he was exaggerating his height a little bit. So I was always kind of like joking to myself in my head that if I ever met Rhett, who is also 6'7", I could do a little scan in my head to find out the truth once and for all. But you know what? For now, I got the Rhett stick, and I will say from down here, it all looks the same. Next, you can visit Cotton Candy Randy's house, which is basically like a haunted house constructed out of cardboard boxes and bugs. In one corner, there's a Rhett shrine, and in another corner, there's a Link unshrine. In the front, you can grab a crayon and doodle on the walls. People are just writing notes. Apparently, this one girl put her IG handle at the very front and gained 100 followers. There was a fog machine blowing out smoke, and there was like creepy audio playing over the speakers. Spooky spooky. Next, you can sit down and relax in the movie house where they're playing old Rat and Link videos. This is the only place that didn't really have a line because you're going in. It's, it, they had like the church pew chairs. Not only was it really nostalgic, but it was also just really fun to laugh out loud at Rat and Link videos with other mythical beasts. Usually, I watch Rat and Link almost exclusively by myself maybe with one other person max, but being in a room of mystical beasts, it was a surprisingly nice time. There was also a barbershop where yes, you can pay to get a real haircut. I saw a photo that someone got the GMM logo shaved into the back of their head. Aside from all the indoor attractions, there was also a carnival area towards the front. There, you could take a hand at axe throwing. I had never ridden a mechanical bull before, so I was glad I found friends that would go with me to do that. Otherwise, there was a whole lot of inflatable things. Some of the sticky variety, there was the uh, strength test. There was also a ferris wheel, but it wasn't running for most of the time, so it said it was just for photos, so that was a little disappointing. <laughs> Alright, it's finally time for the part, which let's be honest, you all have been waiting for. What went wrong at Mythicon? I will say the first thing that surprised me was the schedule. It dropped a week or two beforehand, and when I checked it, that's when I found out that the event is only one and a half days long. When it originally, of course, they never said this explicitly, but it kind of gave the expectation that it would be a full weekend. But really, it's just Saturday, which is a full day starting at 10 a.m., and Friday only being a half day, with the first event starting at 4 p.m. Not only that, but I was also surprised at how light the schedule was. Normally for conventions or like, you know, big events, the multi-day events like this, they have a lot of things going on at the same time. But as you can see, they never have more than two events going on at the same time.
time. I mean, of course, this makes sense for certain events where they want everybody to be there, but in general, like the reason that conventions like this have so many things going on at the same time is, I mean, part of it is a capacity issue. Like you, you can't have everyone going to the same thing. Otherwise there's not gonna be enough space for everybody. I felt like that did happen quite a few times at the big tent where a lot of the main events were held, where there just weren't enough seats for everyone. So people were standing and crowding in the back. So lots of people would sit on the benches in the eating area, just listening. You may remember me previously mentioning that I kind of started Mythicon off with a bad start. I had a pretty bad impression of the convention at the first like, few hours and I really was not having a great time. A lot of that was because the lines were just so long. I was just shocked that like 90% of the things that you could do there, you had to wait in a long line for. And I waited in about like three lines. I waited in lines for like the merch house. I waited in line for food. The lines were not moving and I just gave up. And it didn't help that it unexpectedly stormed the day before. So it left the area very, very cold. I checked the weather before I went and it was gonna be like 80 something degrees, I think. So I was like, oh yeah, I, should, I don't need to worry about the weather. I'll just bring a light hoodie and I should be fine. But when I got there, it was so cold. And obviously the weather is like not anybody fault. The main stage ended up getting rained out so they had to reschedule some things and I will say the mythical crew and everyone did a really good job of handling that and that's the last minute changes because it was barely noticeable. But the first few hours of my experience in Mythicon was just a whole lot of waiting. First thing I did was run to the tattoo line because I knew that was the single thing that I wanted to do at Mythicon. Like I knew that I am not leaving here without a tattoo. That was the only thing that I was like really looking forward to and I waited there for maybe like 30 minutes to an hour when they cut off the line and said, okay, we're not taking any more appointments today. We're all bugged. So that was a bit of a bummer. Then I moved to a food line because it was so cold that my hands were going numb. So I'm like, okay, I just need something to eat for my body to digest and warm up. I waited about 30 minutes in line for food and I think something like broke or they ran out of food or whatever, but the line didn't move. So I gave up. So then I went to the merch line. I'm like, I need to buy something warm to wear because I'm like literally dying right now. I waited there for only like 20 minutes before I just got fed up and I just left and I'm like, what do I do here? I've been here for almost three hours and I've had one experience so far for about two minutes, the VR house. So yeah, a bit of a rough start. Things finally turned around when I went to the meet and greet and I met those girls in line and they adopted me into their group. And then we went to James and the Shame, saw a great performance and that's when everything, I felt a lot better after that. But honestly, the biggest issue with this convention purely just came down to capacity. I heard that the food trucks were running out of food. I don't think there were even enough food trucks there to begin with. There were only five and I think at some points only three were operating. And if you bought the VIP ticket, there was a third day event where you get to eat brunch with Rhett and Link and the Mythical Crew. And according to the Discord, they didn't have enough room on the shuttles for all the super mega beasts to go to brunch, so some had to call Ubers. They didn't have enough tables and seats at the luncheon. Again, they knew how many of us there were gonna be. Another oversight on the coordination end, but it's getting a bit annoying. There were exactly 150 super mega beast tickets available, so surely they knew how many people were gonna be showing up to this event. So the timing to get in early was actually impossible because doors open at 10, but shuttles start running at 9.30. And it takes more than 30 minutes to even drive there. And if you miss the first wave of shuttles, you're gonna be waiting for a really long time. So I waited over an hour to get on the shuttle, not to mention the drive there too. So I got there much later than expected and they were already not taking tattoo appointments anymore at that point. However, they were gonna reopen appointments at 2 p.m. So people were already lined up for the tattoo over three hours before they were even gonna start taking appointments. I was like, okay, I do wanna wait in this line because this is the only thing that I came here for, but I'm gonna check out some other stuff first. So I waited in line for an hour to do something else and then I came back and then waited in line for two hours. And I was relatively close to the start of the line. I think I may have been like the 20th person, but what we found out was that they had already already been fully booked like from the beginning. If they weren't, maybe they had like five spots left or something because the majority of us who went in were just to put our name down on the wait list. And when I looked down at the wait list, my name was like on the third page or something. Like there were so many people. It was completely unfeasible that any of us were gonna get tattoos unless everyone who previously made an appointment just forgot or decided that they didn't want one anymore, which clearly was not the case because those people waited too. It sucked because yeah, I waited in the line for two hours, but I also looked behind me and the line had grown so long and I just knew that there was no chance that any of those people were getting a tattoo and I felt bad that they were waiting. I was in the guaranteed to get a tattoo list from waiting an hour in line yesterday and have been checked in since yesterday and they said I probably won't get one either. So expect many more upset and disappointed comments about this. And this poor person cried for like 15 minutes because this was like icing on the cake after they had to miss Good Mythical Evening 2 after all that drama. Most disappointing thing about Mythicon, me and many others have sat in the tattoo line since they opened and got here at 7 a.m. to do these tattoos. Been on call since 2 p.m. It 
like finally comms and we're told, sorry, we're fully booked for the day and maybe if there's openings, we can get you in. Very sad and disappointed and no, I don't want to just get the tattoo elsewhere, kind of defeats the whole purpose. So let me run through this real quick. It was one to two hours wait for the shuttle, one and a half hours for the meet and greet, 45 minutes to an hour for a food truck. Many people waited up to three to four hours for tattoos that they never got. On average, 20 or 30 minutes for the bar. Nobody was in line for the carnival stuff at all. It didn't seem very popular, which was kind of sad. And also I will say there was hardly ever a line for the bathroom, which was such a godsend. I really appreciated that. And also they had like the nicer bathrooms where it's like kind of in those elevators trailers and set of the porta potties which were available but you didn't have to use them i never waited more than like two minutes for the bathroom wait time for side attractions was about 45 minutes on average depending on what time of day you went and what also actually surprised me was when people started lining up to go into the live show so not because the live show had started this was like three to four hours before doors opened people were just lining up to be the first ones to go in so that they could get a good position which seemed a little sad to me because that's like three guaranteed hours of you're just gonna be sitting there in one spot just waiting when there's all these other things that you could be doing kind of. After a while, I started to kind of understand why like a third of the people there were like waiting in line in this gigantic line that snaked around the entire venue. It's because honestly, like towards the end when we were waiting for the live show, that last like one and a half hours, me and my group were like, actually bored. There wasn't really much to do. And then it hit me that yes, this whole thing has been kind of annoying where like everything you do, you have to wait in a really long line, but also, if there weren't those lines, then we would have run out of things to do by day one. So whether or not that was planned, I don't know, but the timing actually worked out pretty well where we had gotten to do every single thing at least once, at least the free stuff, so not like the barbershop or the tattoo. The venue was simply too small, and I'm not sure how many tickets were sold. I'm guessing there were like at least a thousand people there, and I know, like I'm almost certain that they had decided on this venue before they even announced Mythicon, so I'm sure, that, especially this being their first year, they didn't know how many tickets were going to be sold, and I mean, you know what? It's a great problem to have. Have. having too many fans like this happened a good mythical evening this year too if you tuned in for that live stream it ended up getting canceled there were so many people that were trying to get in and watch that it actually broke moment house's servers and they had to reschedule the entire event and i mean like I said, it's a great problem to have. You have too many fans who just want to be there and want to see you. I really like the idea of it being held at a ranch. I feel like that's really unique and cool, but I do hope they hold it at a different venue next year because it simply just cannot hold everybody. And all the houses where they housed like all the little side attractions, they were frankly tiny. There was no way that you were going to be able to fit everybody there, especially like the Mythical Society house with how many people are part of the Mythical Society and technically have like access to go in. Especially when you think about there's going to be a greater proportion of people who go to Mythicon who are already in the mythical society, you know what I mean? If they're willing to spend hundreds of dollars to come to Mythicon, I'm sure that they'd be willing to spend at least $5 a month to be in the mythical society, you know what I'm saying? While the things that they had, I thought they were very high quality, very well done. It's just, it's a short experience. It's like, oh, this is really cool. I just want to go look at this for like five to 10 minutes. They're not the type of thing that I would want to do over and over again. I would say for next year, it would be a good idea to have at least one or two things that are always going on that you can return to and do multiple times. That is just like a fun time killer in a way. Also having more things going on would simply help with capacity because you know, there's more people going to that thing instead of all crowding at this thing. And I think that was the idea behind the carnival portion, but for some reason, this demographic was not about it. There was never a line for any of the carnival stuff. It was basically pretty barren on that side of the venue. And I think the reason for that is that a lot of the attractions there are all things that we've done before, you know, like the inflatable playground, the inflatable slide, like the, the strength test and the mechanical bull and the axe throwing were a bit more out there and a bit more unique, which I thought that was cool. But other than that, being at Mythicon, I think it would have been really cool to see more mythical related stuff at like the funhouse area. I mean, over the years, Mythical have come up with so many creative, unique games that were at Link of Play that I've always wanted to play at home, but I didn't really have the means to, or like I need multiple people to help me set this up. You know, for example, like the blind taste test or like the smelling bee challenge or anything of that nature. I know that people submit like wheel videos all the time. They're like, oh, we're doing the blind chicken taste test today. And like, those are games that you can play at home. And I think it would have been really cool if like, there was some kind of play on that. Obviously it's probably really expensive and hard to manage for everyone at the convention, but maybe there would be some kind of way that people can sign up ahead of time. Even on a simpler level, what if we played like the shuffleboard game or the darts game, or they did have ax throwing, which yes, shuffleboard and darts are real games in real life outside of Mythical, but if they add just like a little Mythical twist to it, or even just decorated it in the way that Mythical does it on the show. I know that they were filming live podcasts throughout the day. It would have been really cool if they filmed like a live GMM episode too. Of course, the biggest reason why this probably wouldn't be able to happen is because uh, Rent and Link are 
probably going to be very busy. They're booked. They're going to be exhausted from all the other things they're performing in. But you know, what if they did a live GMM episode, but hosted by like two crew members? I know they did this years ago where they would have two other people, not Ira and Link, host Good Mythical Morning or Good Mythical More. And if they did do a live GMM episode, it would be really cool if they did one of the segments in which the mythical beasts vote on like, oh, what do you think is the worst food combo? And you know, like we all vote on Instagram. But instead, this time we're voting in real life, in real time. That way there would be even more fan involvement, which I did think we saw like a good portion of. There was like the eating contest and they had they brought up people on stage during the live show. However, I would have loved to see even more of that. In addition to the eating contest, what if they had a cosplay contest? Or what if they had a Rhett and Link impersonation contest? I, I'm just imagining how that would go down and I feel like that would be pure chaos. Or we could do one of those episodes of like trying every flavor of Blink and then we each submit our personal rankings. At the end of the convention, we could see how our rankings average out and see the official Mythical Beast ranking of the best Skittle flavors, you know? Opportunity for a sponsorship. I actually was kind of surprised that there was nothing related to sport there because that has been something that they've been plugging really hard lately. And you know what? If we did that, that could be an episode or not an episode, an article on sports. I didn't get to see that much of trivia because I was stuck waiting in a line. But when I finally got there, like the execution and planning for it was actually very high quality, even better than I expected. But I did hear that the questions were quite hard and I would love to see a version of that that is a bit more casual and a bit easier for the newer and more casual watchers, as new and casual as you would be to stay Still show up to Mythicon, but even if they had like a Kahoot game running in one of the rooms that we can all participate in at the same time, it's a lot easier to see on the screen. The issue with the trivia was that there was just not enough seating in the main house, so we were sitting out on the patio, so we could only hear what they were saying, we couldn't really see. I think to fill out the schedule, they could have had more listening parties, things like that can have more than one session, and that's a low maintenance thing, you can put it on repeat, you don't need a mythical crew member specifically to be there. They did actually have quite a few staff members that were not mythical crew, actually almost all the people that you kind of interacted with, like people who were organizing the shuttle lines or doing security and the bag check-in or managing the lines for all the side attractions, none of them were mythical crew. So you weren't gonna have like a meet and greet while you're waiting in line, okay? I talked to one person and he says he works for Live Nation, which makes sense. They do a lot of big events. I don't know if they hired any other like outside parties to help them with that, but it seemed like a lot of the people who were helping out were not part of mythical. For the meet and greets, I think it would have helped a lot if everyone had their own time slot. I actually thought that it would be broken up a little bit more, but in fact, in fact, everyone who was meeting Stevie and Chase was going to the meet and greet house at 6.30 p.m., which in turn ended up with a lot of people waiting one to two hours. And I've seen this done at other events where people are given like a very specific time slot, like you're coming at 6.42. And that way it minimizes the crowds and waiting in lines. It also helps to ensure that people aren't like hogging their time. I have no idea what the time limit was or if they ever cut people off. But since we weren't given a time frame of how long that we should talk to them and how much would be appropriate, I feel like it is easy to run over. Or maybe if we knew like, okay, you get two minutes to talk to Rhett and Link, then it could help you plan better what you want to say to them and maybe not to go too overtime. The issue with that is that there's always going to be a few people who don't want to talk for two full minutes, but since they get two minutes, they're going to feel like they'll have to hog the time anyways. But I feel like those people are, are far and few between, especially for Rhett and Link. I'm sure there are very few people who were there who are just there to snap a photo. Of course, the downside of giving everyone individual time slots is, you know, what happens if people don't show up? Or like when you get your physical ticket, then each person has to make sure that they have their respective ticket. What happens if you're late. And of course it takes a lot more effort to manage, but at least it's something that could be done with additional staff. It doesn't necessarily have to be a mythical crew member who is doing all of that stuff. I will say cell phone signal was hardly ever an issue. You were always able to connect to the internet when you're waiting in line or anything. Thank God for all of our monkey brains. Unless you were currently standing in the middle of a crowd, you were always able to get on your phone, which was very helpful. I was very grateful for that. There was free Wi-Fi, but apparently it didn't work for a lot of people, but I didn't even need to try it because I got the Verizon Unlimited. It was a pretty common sentiment amongst most of the people that I talked to at the convention that like, oh, we don't want to be like ungrateful or grumpy about it, but like, these lines really suck. It was getting really sufferable towards the end, but also we don't want to discount how much work they've put into pouring every single detail into this thing. And we're all here for these two guys who have greatly impacted our lives in a positive way for free 99. And I've worked behind the scenes on a lot of conventions and like multi-day programs for hundreds of people. I know how much work goes into planning these things down to the budgeting, hiring external teams and coordinating with vendors, not to mention the legal affairs. There were waivers and waivers on waivers at this place. Some people had multiple red wristbands going up and down each arm. So it was quite redundant, but nobody's getting sued today. There are more details that they have to consider than you would even imagine, even down to placing where each trash can should be. And I know that there's only so much staff. I don't know how much of the mythical crew was involved in planning this. Like, I don't know if their entire like payroll was working on this thing, but I feel like I didn't see that many mythical crew members. I could be wrong. And I hope this doesn't like step on the mythical crew's toes or anything, because I think they did an incredible job. The ideas that they had that they end up did executing at the convention, I thought were like top notch. 
notch. I just think that they need more things to do. Maybe if there wasn't enough space or people to man these extra attractions, the attraction should at least be things that you wouldn't mind returning to that you can do more than once. There is so much mythical content out there, so many ideas from over the years, and you can make so many deep cuts with, you know, how loyal that these fans are and how long a lot of us have been watching that the possibilities are endless. And I'm really excited to see how this convention grows and improves year after year. I will be back every single year. That is a promise. Up until the very last one where Rhett and Link commit mutual homicide. It's 1.36. You can't see that at all. Finally made it home from Mythicon. Holy fuck. I cannot wait to tell you about this. This may have been my favorite, the best event that I have ever attended in my entire life. Despite the flaws and all the obvious kinks that need to be worked out, forgiven, okay? And not just because I'm a huge fan, so in my eyes, my idols can do no wrong. That's not true. Maybe it is a little bit. But this was life-changing. I have been touched emotionally. I feel like I've grown as a person. I've met so many new friends. I will definitely be coming back next year and every single year that this is held. And I'm going to be that person who's like, yeah, I've been going every single year since year one. I can say that. I'm old enough to say that now. Hopefully next year I'll actually get to meet them. So now we get to the question, was Mythicon worth it? There are three tiers of tickets that you can get. There's Beast, which is just general admission, Mega Beast, which is what I got, and Super Mega Beast. Honestly, the only true VIP tier was the Super Mega Beast ticket, and those tickets were super limited. There were only 150 available, but the benefits were enormous. First of all, there's a whole nother day added to your experience. There's a brunch on Sunday with Rhett and Link and the Mythical crew, which is basically guaranteed time to hang out with them and possibly meet them, even if you didn't get a meet and greet. You also get reserved VIP seating at the live show, which is a benefit because that's the only area that they chose when they picked Mythical Beast to go up on stage and also when they threw free merch into the crowd, that was the only area that was reached. But unfortunately, not everyone felt that this seating was VIP. According to a Discord user, along with a photo highlighting the VIP seating as advertised on the Super Mega Beast ticket, I sat in the mud. Others, however, thought that the VIP seating was more about the placement, like getting to be right up front or something, not that you'd be seated on like a velvet throne massage chair. Sorry y'all were having some negative experiences, but we found the Super Mega Beast accommodations to be well worth it. Skipped huge shuttle lines, and the view for Rhett and Link is amazing. I'll take some hay and mud for the unblocked view. But what happens when sitting on the ground is not an option for you? Some people express that they have medical conditions that would make sitting on the ground difficult. There were hay bales that were available to sit on, but those were quickly taken up. While they enjoyed the show, half of it did get cut from the view as a result from having to watch it from the screens despite having the VIP ticket. Which leads us to an important point on ADA accommodations, which personally I cannot speak to. However, according to this user on Discord, it was quite lacking. I'll explain the ADA accommodations to you. Other than wheelchair accessibility, there was nothing. I was in contact with the ADA accommodations team for weeks about my disability until they finally gave up and told me there wasn't anything they could do and I'd have to address my needs to security when I arrive. In the end, we had to go through several layers of management to get the exceptions I needed and it was a hassle to try and keep the staff in the know for the entire weekend. I'm curious if you got that ticket, if it secretly like improves your chances at getting the meet and greet that you wanted, but I don't know. The only reason that I got the second tier is because the first tier was sold out. I wanted that one, but since it was sold out, I got the second tier because I just wanted like the greatest chance possible to meet Rhett and Link. I didn't end up getting to meet them and I should have just read it closer because I kind of regret getting the second tier ticket actually and here's why. The only difference between the Beast ticket for $300 and the Mega Beast ticket for $400 is exclusive merch. You get a Mythicon poster that's signed by Rhett and Link. You could get that at the store for $20 but it's unsigned. There's this blanket. This was worth $60 in the store. You also get this lanyard thing. Honestly, I thought this was my ticket but there's no code on it. They didn't scan or anything. I think it's just to wear around your neck to show that like I paid extra for the ticket. It's just for like a collectible item. You get four free drink tickets, which is only for the bar, and I didn't even finish using mine actually. I don't think I saved money or time because I wouldn't have gotten a lot of the merch that they gave me anyways. Like, I don't think I wanted that blanket. I'm not sure if I'll ever use it. I also wouldn't have gotten alcohol, so I didn't need the free drink tickets. The lanyard is cute, but generally useless, and I still waited in line to buy merch that I actually did want. So now I can say it probably wasn't worth the extra hundred dollars, unfortunately, but I just wanted my shot my best shot at meeting Rhett and Link. So I'm like, I just dove right in and bought the most expensive ticket I could. It may or may not have increased my likelihood of getting the meet and greet that I wanted. I got my second choice, but again, was it worth it? I say yes, a hundred percent. It is completely worth it, if not just alone for seeing the live performances. Did, was I just speaking English? Does that make grammatical sense? I don't know, but you get my point. For me, every penny I spent was 100% worth it just to see them perform live, hang out with the crew, and to meet new friends for the first time who are as hardcore about GMM as I am.
Okay, let's go over the total amount of money I spent. For the Mega Beast ticket, including fees, I spent $430. For a hotel, I did not get the Hilton, I did not get the Hyatt. Those were included in packages and they were expensive. I got the most ratchet hotel that I could find. I didn't think it would matter because I'm barely spending any time at the hotel anyways, but I low-key kind of regret the hotel choice because one, I don't know if there was bed bugs or something, but I got bites all over me the first night. Two, there were sketchy people everywhere. I was like, what the fuck is going on? I'm terrified right now. Plus, since I stayed at one of the hotels that was not part of the like official package, there was no shuttles there, I had to Uber back around. So that brings me to the Ubers. I spent $156 on Ubers. How? I was shocked calculating this. Like, I don't know what happened. I could not tell you. I spent $38 at the store on merch that I actually did want. Wait, I'm a dumbass. I totally forgot to include. So for my flight, I only spent about $42 because I was using my credit card points. Hell yeah. Tickets were going for over $300 and I even heard someone flew here from Australia. That is insane. For food and drinks both days, I spent $52. So the total amount that I spent, are you ready for this? Drum roll, please. $1,029. Let's fucking go. This is not including the money that I spent on my cosplay. Obviously, I didn't include that because that's a very optional part of the experience. If I did get the tattoo, that would have been $150 plus fees and tip, which I would have done if I had the chance. But come on, first of all, what kind of convention is not hundreds of dollars, all right? And for the conventions that are less than $100, is it planned, run, and featuring a giant group of people that you've developed a gripping parasocial relationship by watching long form content of them daily over the past several years? I think it's way more meaningful than any old convention. Also, I strongly believe in supporting the things that bring you joy, especially if they're providing you that entertainment for free. Support the creators that you love. If you have the means, buy the merch, join their Patreon. If you don't have the means, then share their videos with your friends, you know, interact with them on social media and boost their engagement. Turn off your ad blocker and watch their ads. Make an entire video promoting their convention for free. What? Get your tickets now, Yes, the convention was not perfect. It had issues as expected. It's the first time doing it. Having been watching since season one and seeing how far the show has evolved and grown to the point that they're having their own convention, bitch, I could cry. I was just standing there, taking it all in, seeing all these mythical beasts, seeing the people that I am obsessed with right there on stage like they could spit on me if they wanted to so much of the mythical crew have become main characters on the show their wives and their families have become a lot more involved with the show as well it feels like the best parasocial family ever that just keeps on growing even though the whole side attractions thing really dimmed my experience at mythicon the side attractions themselves were very high quality it was purely logistics it was just a capacity issue but i do like that even though like yes it was really crowded and busy it was still relatively small i don't know what rent and link's previous live shows were like but honestly the crowd was not that big like it was pretty easy for you to get up to the front if you wanted to especially me just by myself like i could squeeze up there by the end as people were starting to shuffle out and i'm like i got so close to them like literally i was like right in front of Rhett and link like whoa. also because it's on a smaller side i really felt the community aspect a lot more when i was just walking around i often would recognize like oh that's the girl that sang karaoke on stage last night or oh that's the group i ran into yesterday let me run over and go say hi like it felt like the size of you walking around the halls in high school i also felt so inspired just as a creative person. I love the fact that they started their journey in their mid 30s because it just goes to show you that you don't have to have your entire life figured out in your 20s, girl. Your greatest years and the legacy you leave with the world can happen at any point in your life. Being there, experiencing and enjoying the fruits of their labor, not only just for the single convention, but what they've built over the past 10 years and all the people that showed up to this thing because they care about this just in the same way that I do. Yes, logistically some things needed work, but a lot of that could be solved with just adding more events, finding a bigger venue, but I just felt like such a proud mythical beast seeing how far this company has grown from just two tall dudes sitting at a desk that is way smaller than you think it should be. I am so glad I went alone. I know there were a lot of people that went alone to this thing because it's not like of concert, you know? It's hard to go to something like this if you're not already a huge fan. I'm sure some people got dragged by their significant others or friends, but I have absolutely no regrets going alone. If you do, just make sure you're safe. I'm so glad that I cosplayed. If you do go alone to something like this, I definitely recommend cosplaying because it's just a conversation starter. It can connect you with similar people. Also, it's convenient that it was held on Halloween weekend, so you don't even have to dress up within the GMM lore. You can just dress up in general. Lots of people just dressed up in regular costumes. Apparently, there was also a Discord someone made for all the solo goers. I missed that boat, but it's really cool that the community is there for you. If Fret and Link or anyone from the Mythical crew is watching this video, I just want to say I love you. I'm sorry for the criticism. I hope you take it as constructive. I greatly enjoyed Mythicon and I appreciate all the hard work you put into this. And I hope I get to meet more of you next year. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for watching this video and for making it to the very end. If you liked it, feel free to leave a like, subscribe to my channel, and let me know if you're a Mythical Beast, how long you've been watching. Are you going to go to Mythicon next year? Am I going to see you? Are you going to cosplay? Hold on. I got my other mic here so I can do a mic drop. Slutty Cotton Candy Randy out.